Hello and welcome to Whence Came You, a Freemasonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. I'm your host, Robert Johnson, the York Rite Mason and Knight Templar. Okay, the sale on the app is over and it went well. We have some new users on the Podcast Box app for the Apple. And next, I'd like to mention our friends at Stitcher, Smart Radio. Stitcher will give you access to the show streaming for free. Make sure you enter the promo code when you register with them, which is Whence Came You. No spaces. And it will let them know that you came to Stitcher to listen to Whence Came You, and they send us a dollar to keep the lights on. Also, it automatically enters you in a cash drawing for 100 bucks. So check it out. Stitcher Smart Radio on all mobile devices. Click the link at the top of the website, wcypodcast.com, and it will take you right to where you need to go. Speaking of the website, you may have noticed over the weekend I went button crazy. Every link is now a shiny new button style similar to that which is used on most touchscreen devices for apps. I think it looks nice and adds some fun to the site. Also, I think it makes it easier to navigate. There are also a few new links on the site, like the link to Mackey's Masonic Encyclopedia, which is really nice. Also, if you have noticed, we are a registered domain now. WCYpodcast.blogspot.com has become just WCYpodcast.com. Don't worry, your links to us and everything else will automatically redirect. Also, the Flash Player we use to listen to episodes on the website is being upgraded this upcoming week to a brand new and shiny HTML5 template. If you're unaware what that is, just know that it's going to be better. Over the weekend, I saw a link that got me a little excited. My friend and Canadian brother John Paul Gomez came out with his new line of Freemasonic neckties. Now, I all know you have seen neckties that have little square encompasses all over them, and to be honest, I just don't like those. They are pretty generic and boring, and to be honest, not attractive. So when I went looking for a necktie, and I found fraternal ties, I jumped for joy. John Paul is a graphic designer and designs these amazing ties that will blow your mind. Head on over to Fraternal Ties and check out the new 2012 catalog. There are only about five to seven designs, which are extremely limited. This isn't your typical type of limited. When I say limited, I mean he only makes about 50 of each design. That's not like 50,000. I mean 50. I ordered the Memento Mori 2 last week, and from what I understand, that one is selling pretty quick. I think there are about 30 units left. The ties are about $60. However, they come with a pocket square and cufflinks to match, all packaged in a beautiful box. If the economics concerns you, think about this. A designer tie is going to cost you $30 to $40. A matching pocket square and cufflinks is going to add another $40. I own a few of these ties, and I love them. They make great knots, and they're made very well. So support our brother and check them out. You will find the link to his website, Fraternal Ties, on the right-hand side under Masonic Business. The first piece I have for you guys this week is from the One Minute Mason from Wednesday, July 25th, 2012. The Illumination. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, or JFK, participated in a Masonic ceremony on October 6th, 1962. While flying over the area, JFK pushed a button by remote control, illuminated a statue the Grand Lodge of Illinois was rededicating. The statue in downtown Chicago honored brothers George Washington, Robert Morris, and Haim Solomon. Next is from the Grand Lodge of British Columbia. Lodges and Grand Lodges whose charters roots derive from the United Grand Lodge of Ancient Free Masons of England. The Grand Lodge of Ireland or the Grand Lodge of Ancient Free and Accepted Masons of Scotland use the expression AF and AM. Those Grand Lodges that don't use the appellation Ancient claim descent from the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons under the Constitution of England during the period from 1717 until 1813. This English Grand Lodge was constituted from four lodges on June 24, 1717. A later Grand Lodge in England styling themselves ancient labeled their first group modern, although today the preferred term is premier. The moderns and ancients united in November 25, 1813 to form the United Grand Lodge of Ancient Freemasons of England, now styled the United Grand Lodge of Ancient Free and Accepted Masons of England. The choice of style is not universal as some Grand Lodges simply choose one or the other title for reasons of their own. The usage has no bearing on regularity or recognition. Ancient or ancient Freemasons. Mostly Irish Freemasons formed this Grand Lodge in London in 1751, properly titled the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of England according to the old institutions. It is also called Athol Freemasons. 
after the third and fourth dukes of Athol. Free. It is quite likely that the word Freemason represented at least three distinct meanings, each having respect to a different century. Skilled medieval builders worked with an even-grained limestone or sandstone called freestone, first mentioned in 1212 in Normandy. The term freestone mason is recorded in 1375, and the term was easily condensed to Freemason. Centuries later, this meaning became secondary, if not forgotten, when town mason guilds became more powerful. It is hypothesized that a Freemason was free of his guild, he had the freedom of the, its privileges and was entrusted with certain rights. The London Company of Freemasons changed its name to that of Masons in 1655-56, perhaps recognizing that the term had undergone yet another change in meaning. Members who were not stone masons could be accepted in the company and were termed speculative, free, or accepted. In time, the term became synonymous and free, then referred to an inner fraternity of speculative masons. There are many other discredited theories. The tradition that 6th and 7th century builders traveled France and Italy freely by authority of papal bull is unfounded. Another theory has it that the medieval Freemason was either not tied to the land or else being attached to a monastery or ecclesiastical order was free from the guilds. During the height of the abbey and church building period, there were few, if any, town mason guilds, so this derivation is suspect. Free and accepted. This term was first used in 1722 in J. Roberts' The Old Constitutions Belonging to Ancient and Honorable Society of Free and Accepted Masons. Accepted. Exception was an inner fraternity of speculative Freemasons found within the worshipful company of Masons of the City of London. Operative members were admitted by apprenticeship, patrimony, or redemption. Speculative members were accepted. First recorded use of the term dates from 1620. That's the end of that piece, so I guess that last part was kind of interesting because if you were an actual Mason of sorts, you were admitted by apprenticeship, but if you were just speculative, you were accepted. Interesting. Next is a short piece from the Knight Templar magazine. This one is from August of 2012, number 8, entitled Still on the Trail of a Mystery by Amy E. Newell. Back in the August 2010 issue of Knight Templar, I wrote about a portrait in the Scottish Rite Masonic Museum and library's collection that depicts an unidentified Knight Templar. In the article, I suggested that it might be Robert H. Chamberlain, 1838 to 1910, of Worcester, Massachusetts, who served as Grand Commander from 1891 to 1892, but this was far from a secure attribution. Several readers contacted me after the issue was published and made helpful suggestions. A California reader submitted his comments in a letter to the editor that appeared in the January 2011 issue. While he regretted that he could not help with identifying the man in the portrait, he did make an important plea, reminding us all to document the people in our photos, whether they are prints or digital. I can't applaud his point enough. Our collection is full of images from the 1800s and 1900s that shows marvelous people doing fascinating things, but we don't know who they are, or in many cases, even where. Another reader wrote to me and suggested that if the man in the portrait was a grand commander, his regalia would have been trimmed with gold instead of silver. Indeed, as a general of Grand Encampment started to standardize Knight Templar regalia in 1856, they mandated that the Grand Officer should wear gold trimmings. From Montana, I was directed to a photograph of Lewis Anderson Dilly, which appeared in the February 1968 issue of Knight Templar. Dilly wears a Templar regalia in the photo and bears a resemblance to the man in the portrait, but he wears a white sash rather than a black one worn in the portrait. As I explained in the article, the black sash was typical for New England commanderies, so I don't think this Midwestern Knight Templar would have stood for a portrait in a black sash. A member from Worcester County here in Massachusetts wrote me a very helpful email explaining that he checked the published history of Worcester County commandery, but did not turn up any possible identifications for the portrait. He also reiterated the questions that come from the man's regalia. For example, if he was past commander, wouldn't he be wearing a past commander's jewel? The apron was unlike any this gentleman had ever seen. The apron was a definite point 
of interest for me. As I mentioned in the article, it is quite unusual since it shows the cross and crown symbol rather than the far more common skull and crossbones. None of the regalia catalogs in our collection show the Knight Templar aprons with that design. So, I thought that it was a conceit of the artist or a request of the subject. Then this past spring, as I was rehousing part of our apron collection and storage, I came across a Knight Templar apron with this design. No skull and crossbones, just the cross and crown symbol. Unfortunately, the apron does not have a label for its maker, but it does seem to date from the early 1900s. A label for its original owner, Eugene R. Stone of Quincy, Massachusetts, is sewn to the back. Stone was born in 1871 and served as mayor of Quincy in 1912 and 1913. He was raised to Master Mason on February 7, 1901, and evidently also joined the Knights Templar. Stone was quite active in the local yacht club. He died on May 9, 1945. The painting held an important place in the museum's exhibition, inspired by fashion, American Masonic Regalia, which was on view through March 10, 2012. The portrait was the centerpiece of the section about the inspiration of military uniforms on Masonic Regalia. It was flanked by a World War II Army uniform and a Knight Templar uniform complete with chapeau, gauntlet, sash, and the apron with a cross and crown motif. Perhaps a museum visitor has seen the painting on exhibit and will help us solve this continuing mystery. For more information about the exhibition inspired by fashion, American Masonic Regalia, visit the website at www.nationalheritagemuseum.org or you can call 781-861-6559 if you think you can identify the man in the portrait or have questions about the collection. Please contact Dr. Amy E. Newell. And one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to take this photo and I'm going to put that in with the bonus material and take a look at it. We're going to post it on the blog too. Perhaps we can find somebody who can identify the guy in the photo. Now one thing I wanted to read about but I think I will wait until next week, is how Freemasonry has infiltrated a video game. About five years ago, I had some friends that played a massive multiplayer computer game called The World of Warcraft. It's immensely popular, and it's pretty fun too. I played it for about six months. After that, I just had too much to do to sign on with my friends and complete magical missions and such. But recently, a friend of mine asked if I would play again if he rejoined as well. I thought about it, but ultimately I still don't have the time to play. But it got my mind thinking. Groups meet up in this virtual world. And then I thought, do Freemasons meet up in this virtual world as well? I mean, people get legally married in the game. Why can't other things happen there also? Well, they do. There are virtual lodges and guilds of Freemasons in the game. Real people talking real time over the internet with avatars of their personas meeting in buildings as lodges. I'm not sure to the legality of that. However, it sounds fun. I guess I'll go into more detail on that next week. Also, another upcoming event is a feature piece I wrote for the Midnight Freemasons, which will be up on the 6th of August, 2012. This week's famous Freemason is Sir Charles Warren, born in 1840 died January 21st, 1927. Soldier, explorer, and archaeologist, Charles Warren was born in Bangor and educated in Sandhurst. As an agent of the Palestine Exploration Fund in 1867, he surveyed Herod's temple and conducted excavations in Jerusalem, recording his discoveries in two books, The Temple of the Tomb and Under Jerusalem. Warren was elected founding master of Coronati Lodge, number 2076, in 1884. The lodge warrant was granted on November 28, 1884, but due to Warren's departure to Bugana, Africa, the lodge did not meet until after his return at the end of 1885. He was installed at the first regular meeting on January 12, 1886, when the lodge was consecrated. Warren attended three of the seven meetings called during his almost three-year term of office, his last being March 1887 when he read papers on the orientation of temples. A.F.A. Woodford opened the lodge in September 1887 when Robert Freck Gold was elected master. Sir Charles was London Metropolitan Police Commissioner from March 1886 to November 7, 1888. He resigned in conflict with the Home Security 
Henry Matthews earlier on the day that Mary Jane Ann Kelly, the last Whitechapel murder victim ascribed to Jack the Ripper, was found killed. Initiated December 30th, 1859, and he was a past master in 1863, Royal Lodge of Friendship No. 278, Gibraltar, E.C., past Grand Deacon, 1887, District Grand Master, 1891 to 1895, and District Grand Lodge of the Eastern Archipelago, UGLE. That's it for this week. Remember to find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Whence Came You. Email us and add us to your circle at the email address wcypodcast at gmail.com. We're on almost every social network there is, including Pinterest also. Check out our YouTube and Vimeo channels as well. If you like the show and you want to grab the Android or Apple app, check those links out on our website. If you like the show but don't want access to the bonus features, a great alternative is Stitcher Smart Radio. Remember, enter the promo code whence came you and registration is free and they donate a dollar to the show. So until next week, for whence came you, I'm Robert Johnson. <laughs>